Your Steve Jones Show podcast is loading now. The Steve Jones Show podcast is sponsored by Purdy Insurance. Visit Purdy Insurance on Market Street in Sunbury or visit online at purdyinsurance.com. Sports talk where your voice counts. This is the Steve Jones Show on News Radio 1070 WKOK. Now from the Sunbury Motor Studio, here's Steve Jones. Today's show brought to you by Purdy Insurance, Market Street in Sunbury. Go to purdyinsurance.com. Purdy Memorial Golf Tournament to benefit the Greater Susquehanna Valley YMCA is a week from Wednesday, nine days away. And I'm in the Sunbury Motor Studio. Sunbury Motors, Force Rated Sunbury. Summary Motors, Kia Roots 11 and 15, and Hummel's Wharf. Phillies beat the Braves yesterday, courtesy of a three-run homer. Scott Fransky with the call on the Phillies radio network and WKOK. Swing and a high fly left center field. This is well hit. And Ciarte is back, and this ball is gone. Back-to-back-to-back home runs for the Phillies here in the eighth. Odubel Herrera opposite field up the alley with his second homer of the season. And it's now 5-1 to one, Phillies. And that's our play-by-play call of the day. The Phillies uh, did win the game 5-2 to two over the Braves yesterday. Very pleased to be joined by Bruce Feldman, who was out at Penn State football practice, I want to say maybe about 10 days ago. And I apologize I didn't get a chance to go over and talk with you that day. Uh, but, Bruce, welcome. It's great to have you with us. Thanks for the time. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, the day I was out of practice was the day of your uh, punt catching experience, and I was rooting for it to happen. So. Well, when it landed on the ground, there were about a hundred disappointed football players. That's not exactly the crowd you're trying to make mad. No, but at least you didn't take it off the face either. So <laughs> you got that right. <laughs> Bruce, uh, you had a chance to travel around and see a lot of different programs. First of all, let's start, since you got the full experience of not only talking with the coaches, but then seeing it play out on the field, what general impression did you walk away from with Penn State? That this offense should be even better uh, than it was last year, which is saying something. I mean, I was at the Rose Bowl, and it was very impressive what they did. Uh, You know, I think Joe Moorhead was a terrific hire for James Franklin, and obviously that proved to be the case. But you look at Nick Sorley, he's back. You look at, you know, Saquon Barkley, he's as good as any player in college football. But the thing that really surprised me was the athleticism, but the size of the receivers. I mean, this is a huge group of receivers. And obviously when I say that, I'm including, you know, an awesome tight end, too. Uh, They should be as good offensively as anybody in the country. And to me, that stood out. And I, you know, like I said, I, I, I visited 10 different schools, or actually 12 different schools this spring, and I don't see anybody who, who is any, has any more amount of firepower or better fit for the system. question ultimately is going to be, you know, they have some athletes on defense. I don't think they have as many at this point as, say, Ohio State or even USC. But uh, I don't – after watching them – I'm not shocked that they ended up being a you know a top ten team last year because they're they're legit on offense and there's nothing fluky about them. Are we in an era of college football where you look at a defensive coordinator and you say, look, just get me one more stop each half? Are we in that era right now? Unless you have like the Alabama kind of personnel, which is like almost three deep with NFL kind of size, I think you are. Because just defensively, people don't have kind of the difference makers in the front seven to disrupt everything. You know, at the tempo you see, and it's it's just such a different feel now with with the game as it is. So you can have really good players, a good secondary guy here or there, but I just think offense is you know with the run pass option game, it's not like it is the NFL because the linemen, you know, it's the three yard rule versus the one yard rule. I think the time spent that's committed to, to the preparation, it's just not like the NFL. So you get good at something, and then it becomes uh, it becomes this kind of chess match. And I just think it's unrealistic to expect to shut down teams for 60 minutes, you know, every week. It's just, just, just 
really hard to do that. You discussed the athleticism of the Penn State defense because Koa Farmer at one point had been a safety now playing outside linebacker and a guy that can run in the four fours if he wants to. Is that the trend that you're seeing, Bruce, that you can take somebody who has the frame to do it? You have to have the frame. You just can't put weight on somebody and tell them to play. But is that the trend that you're seeing that maybe 10 years ago a guy that was safety is now an outside linebacker, guy that was an outside linebacker 10 years ago is now a defensive end? Is that more the trend we're seeing? Yeah, I think that's a big part of the, so much of the game is played in space. And you need guys who have that kind of athleticism. Obviously, everybody would love to have as much speed as possible. But, uh, you know, going to Ohio State a couple of days before that, I talked to one of their players, Chris Worley, who's now the starting middle linebacker. He came in as a 185-pound safety with a good frame, and now he's a 235-pound middle linebacker. And he told me, I think he's like the fifth fastest linebacker they have. And he runs in the four fives. You know, now that obviously speaks to the kind of talent Urban Meyer has there, but it also speaks to the kind of athletes. And you saw some of that a couple of years ago when they won the national title. You had guys like Darren Lee, who was another, you know, was a safety and then becomes a walkout linebacker. And he runs in the, you know, sub four five. And they have that kind of athleticism. And there's just a. It's just a different kind of premium put on it now. You also had a good look at the Ohio State defensive front. Larry Johnson, like Sean Spencer, rotates a lot of people up front. When you look at Ohio State's defensive front, A, what are you seeing? And B, when they go to that four defensive end look, what do you like about it? Well, first of all, that's the thing you see is so many defensive ends. I mean, they probably have four defensive ends that would start at 95% of the power five schools in the country, much less in college football. They have one terrific inside guy in Draymond Jones, who is a former basketball player who's really developed there. And uh, you mentioned that Larry Jones, Larry Johnson is, is a technician there. And when Greg Schiano, who's you know been an NFL head coach, he's now the defense coordinator there when I visited with him, he said the difference, you know, when he was at Rutgers and he had some guys who would go as first-round draft picks and be NFL players, he said, you know, we had them. We developed these guys by their fourth or fifth year. They were ready to be NFL players. Maybe they're under radar recruits. When you get a, a Nick Bosa come in and he's already a special freaky talent and then he gets with a guy like Larry Johnson or in the case of, of uh, you know, Draymond Jones, these guys, you know, because they're working with such a specialist, it really takes off. And I think that's why, one of the reasons why they are so good is when you have that kind of athleticism coupled with the depth for them to be, you know, the competitive room and the insight they're getting. Obviously, Ohio State is uh, in, in a flow of its program right now. Penn State's in its second year of being back to 85 scholarships. So when you talk to the Penn State coaches, what were some of the general impressions they gave you, Bruce? You know, I think it's – they feel good. I think one of the areas that I heard a bunch was, you know, they, they didn't have, they redshirted some parts, they didn't redshirt others. And you notice when you're able to redshirt and develop guys. And as you said, I mean, they're just now getting settled in at 85 scholarships. It's hard to flip a switch. I think it's pretty remarkable that a team in its first year back at 85 scholarships goes out and wins the toughest division in college football. And that's what the Big, Big Ten East was. But to, to, to kind of build off it, I think Penn State, and this is not what you know, James Franklin or there, there told me, but I think realistically they're probably two years away uh, roster-wise from being where Penn State really needs to be. And I'm not saying they can't win the Big Ten again, because with that offense they certainly can. But just in terms of they have some good players, but they have guys who are maybe a year away on the defensive side, whereas you look at what Ohio State has, Ohio State probably has on defensively better athletes, but they have more better athletes. You know, it's not to say there aren't some athletes, whether it's a Koa Farmer or a guy like a Sharif Miller or some of these other guys, right. Manny Bowen. Sure. They couldn't play there. It's just Ohio State has so many more of them that are ready. And and I think ultimately that's where your margin for error is slimmer. Again, they can outscore anybody. And they have, you know, they're well coached on defense. Their pride did a really good job there. But I just think right now it's the depth and building back where you have the experience and the, and the seasoning of these guys um, you know I, I'm, I'm very curious to see where this program goes now because I just think with the recruiting level that they're in and what James Franklin can do to sell it I mean, he's a very dynamic personality and I think 
made a lot of people forgot what he did at Vanderbilt was one of the more remarkable coaching jobs that any any done, and how bad Vandy was to what he had them do, and now all of a sudden he's got something that's a lot more of a powerful brand to sell, and we're starting to see it now, and I'm curious to see where it goes from here. You mentioned you probably went to maybe 10 to a, a dozen places. What were a couple of standouts, not just individuals, but maybe a standout unit here or there where you walked away and said, you know what, that's a cut above? Uh, you know, I, I'm very interested in see what West Virginia does. They, they they don't have a ton of depth, but Will Greer, who was the starting quarterback in Florida, was 6-0 and and then... Uh, had a positive PED test and left, and right. is now at West Virginia. I think he could be really good, and I think Dana Holgerson has a team that could be very dangerous there. Now, they don't have I, – I think depth-wise, they're lacking, but they have some real good first-line athletes, and their defensive coordinator, Tony Gibson, does a really good job there in a conference that people are pretty suspect on the defensive side of the ball. They have to replace eight starters. And I don't doubt that they could even be better with some of the new guys because they were missing their best player last year, the DB who missed the year. I, I, I'm very interested to see what, what West Virginia does. Uh, you know, we, we talked about Ohio State and just how talented they are. I was out at USC. You know, Sam Darnold, I mean, Penn State fans don't have to <laughs> remind us about him. I mean, they should take another step forward, but we'll see. Um, uh, you know who he reminds me of? Now, obviously, this is a, you know because it's one level to another. But Darnold reminds me of of a young Ben Roethlisberger. Wow, he, physically he's big. Now he's not you know six six two sixty big, but no. in terms of taking his back of that guy and extending plays, there's definitely there's definitely something there in terms of just the the ability to just keep plays alive. Uh, people love his temperament. They love the fact that, you know, unlike a lot of these recruits nowadays, especially quarterbacks, that he wasn't some entitled guy who'd been anointed to be some, some uh, you know, really hyped five-star guy. And to Darnold's credit, he came in the, in the class at the same time as a five-star quarterback that USC had. Darnold proved to be a lot – outplayed that kid. That other kid ended up transferring, and he – He's blossomed into a star and has people really excited out here on the West Coast about him. Uh, again, the way both they and Penn State finished, it was a real revelation for both of them because, as you remember, obviously, when before the Ohio State upset, a lot of people were, you know, writing off Penn State and a lot of people wrote off, uh, wrote off Clay Helton in USC even before yep. earlier in that season last year. Right. No, they were they were one and three to start. Max Brown was the start of the first three. Darnold played well, lost his first start, then hasn't lost since. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, I actually went and saw Max Brown as well. I I spent a day at Pitt, and you know, there's enthusiasm about him, and I feel like he knows he has a lot to prove, and and we'll see as, as you know, Pitt goes the transfer quarterback route again. Uh, one uh, last one, then I'll let you go, Bruce. I appreciate it. We know last year uh, that Jim Harbaugh went to IMG. We know about, obviously, the, the satellite camps. So they've changed rules around all of that. Now they're doing what basketball teams are doing without playing games, and that's going to Italy. What do you think about that, and will the NCAA then take a long look at that? Well, yeah, I mean, I don't expect to see this go on. After, you know, this is kind of like a last-shot deal, I think, for them. And what I think is positive is, you know, college is about, you know, having new experiences and, and educating educating student-athletes. And I think that letting them go to, to Rome and around Italy, I think, is a cool deal if you can do it. And obviously – uh, Michigan football has the wherewithal to do it. I'm sure it's going to drive people up a wall. You know, if you if you're on social media and you follow a bunch of people related to Michigan football, you're you're going to get sick of hearing about Jim Harbaugh. You know, in Italy. I mean, and that's that's kind of Jim Harbaugh. I think it's almost like his personality is such where, hey, not only do I do I get to have this recruiting edge and, and broaden my players' horizons and hopefully bring the team closer together because they're in a foreign country, but also I get to get under a lot of people's skin because they're going to get sick of hearing about Michigan for the next couple of weeks. 
<laughs> I think you just encapsulated all of it perfectly. <laughs> Bruce, thanks so much. I really appreciate the time you gave us today, especially the insight that you gave on the football team and the places you've been. I look forward to talking to you again very much so. Maybe next time I'll catch the darn thing. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Bruce Feldman joining us. What a great guest to get on. By the way, Corey Chavis is going to join us tomorrow to talk about the NFL draft. And uh, appreciate uh, the time Bruce gave us. That was a lot of fun. That was a lot of fun. I forgot he was out there that day. I think he was just grateful they called on me and not him. We'll come back with more tomorrow right here on News Radio 1070 WK. Okay. When the suit puts away the chutter into the golf bag, he does it to the beat of this music. Nice. The rest of us have learned to ignore it. <laughs> it's great to have Bruce Feldman on. Corey Chavis tomorrow. CBS Sports talk about the NFL draft. Corey, of course, played 11 years in the National Football League. And he'll talk about the draft, which is in Philadelphia, beginning on Thursday night. Turns out they've got some free time Thursday night. I'm going to kick back, watch some of it. Uh, at least they now have it down to where it's, what, 10 minutes a pick? I mean, it was 15 minutes of picking. You'd sit there like, oh, holding the card and waiting forever while ESPN is running a feature on how some draft pick walks somebody across the street because they're just nice. Uh, it's like, okay, come on. Let's go here. Chop, chop. I'm here to watch the draft. Okay. I want to watch a documentary on Mother Teresa. I'd turn over to EWTN. Yes, Thursday night, round one will be 10 minutes. <laughs> Friday night for rounds two and three. Round two will be seven minutes between picks. Yeah. Round three is five minutes. Right. And then for Saturday, rounds four, five, and six will go five minutes. And yeah. then round seven, uh, each team has four minutes. Make it work. Make it work. Much smoother now, <laughs> for sure. Much smoother. Oh, well, no, you've got to go look. You go to round one, for example. Right. You've now given the Cleveland Browns months <laughs> to decide <laughs> what they're going to do with it. Months. <clears throat> How many years for well over a decade when they would start it at noon on Saturday? That first round would clear, what, four hours at <laughs> close oh. to <time. laughs> I can remember in 2003. 2003. The blue-white game was opposite the NFL draft. And Penn State had four guys taken in the first round of that draft. Uh, Larry Johnson, Bryant Johnson, uh, Jimmy Kennedy, and Michael Haynes were all taken in the first round of the draft. And Joe Paterno and I are doing the blue-white game. Because if you recall, Joe used to do the blue-white game in the booth with me. And I was always, that, we always had a, I had a lot of fun doing it. I'm not going to speak for him. I think he had fun. He seemed like he was. <laughs> All right. Uh, and I remember one guy went off the board. Was it LJ? Maybe it was LJ. During the course of the Blue White game, when the game was over, they were still in the first round. You're like, what in the heck? They were still in the first round. Played an entire game. <laughs> still in the first round. Now, Penn State had four players go in the first round of that draft. But they used to drag it into kingdom come. Oh, well. And I always laugh about the time frame of it. Look, all of you have had months to put this together. Months. And they act like it's the Manhattan Project. All right, everybody. <laughs> Let's see what we're going to do here now. You're picking 14th. Player falls that you like? Hey, you put your board together, one through 300. Start going through. Gone, 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 gone. Yep, there's our guy. 
or you're just going to stack it up five positions. There's a position you need. Gone, gone, available. Man, I feel like that's what the Steelers did last year when they got the uh, when they got Artie Burns out of Miami. I think there's a couple of other guys they had rated maybe a little higher in their board, but Artie Burns was there. He was the next corner up. I think the third corner up. They were perfectly happy taking him because they liked how he worked out and felt they would do fine with him, which they did. Artie Burns turned out to be a pretty good pick. I thought Sean Davis in the second round turned out to be a good pick. They drafted for need. They did a good job. Eagles drafted for need. They got Carson Wentz. Pretty darn good pick. All right, final half hour coming up at 800 795 9565 on News Radio 1070 WKOK, brought to you by Purdy Insurance. Market Street in Sunbury. Go to purdyinsurance.com. It's April, and you know what that means. Time for the Spring Savings Event at Sunbury Motors Kia. I want to see you in a Kia. Bottom line, April is the best time to buy your next vehicle at Sunbury Motors Kia. During the spring savings event, you can save over $4,000 on 2017 Serranos and all remaining 2016 Optimus. Or you can save $3,000 on a 2017 Kia Forte. If you're looking for low payments, how about 0% financing for 66 months? Need to save money on gas? Then get to SMZ and check out the 50-mile-per-gallon Nero FE starting at $23,895. Plus, you get Kia's 10-year, 100,000-mile limited warranty. So what are you waiting for? It's the Spring Savings Event going on now at Sunbury Motors Kia on the Strip at Hummel's Wharf and at sunburymotors.com. Tax and tax extra. 0% financing to welcome all my customers who came after restrictions apply. Warranty is a limited powertrain warranty. For details, see retailer or go to kia.com. Taking your calls at 800-795-9565. This is the Steve Jones Show on News Radio 1070 WKOK. Now from the Sunbury Motors Studio, here's Steve Jones. Great to uh, be with you on this Monday after the blue-white game. If you want to give me your impressions of it, you can at 1-800-795-9565. Today's show brought to you by Purdy Insurance, Market Street in Sunbury. Go to purdyinsurance.com. And don't forget about the Truman H. Purdy Memorial Golf Tournament, nine days away, Susquehanna Valley Country Club. To benefit the greater Susquehanna Valley YMCA. And I'm in the Sunbury Motors studio, Sunbury Motors, 4th Street in Sunbury, Sunbury Motors Keywords 11 and 15 in Hummel's Wharf. Our sports bozos of the day. Jabril Peppers, Reuben Foster, diluted samples. Yep. You're going to be tested at the Combine, so we're just going to drink ourselves silly with water. Stay hydrated. Why? 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 Seriously, you have individual workouts. You want to skip the workouts of the Combine, you can. Now, Foster has dropped... Um, in his draft evaluation, let's see what happens to Peppers. I mean, he's been at 15, but uh, we shall see. Now, of course, there are a lot of people here. Oh, Michigan guy! Look, once once they're gone and out of school, they're on. You know, look, they're on their own. Nothing to do with that. It's, I realize the competition between schools is always intense, but. So we'll see how it plays out for him. It's uh, not uh, not what he needed uh, or his his group needed to hear uh, 72 hours from the opening round. And I, I think Peppers is a good player, not a great player. And the problem with Peppers is that I see him too much as a tweener. I think more than anything else, he is a safety in the NFL and not an outside linebacker, even though he's worked out for both. So we'll see. And as for Foster, I think Foster's got all the tools to be an excellent NFL linebacker. 
But again, there's been more. It's been interesting. I read, uh, I don't know if you had a chance to read Peter King's article this morning where he talked with Mike Mayock. And in the article, and again, this is why I watch NFL Network for the draft and do not watch ESPN. Uh, And I'm not impugning the reputation of ESPN or the reputation of uh, the people that work very hard on the draft, like the Mel Kuypers and the Todd McShays and the Adam Schefters and so forth. They, They all do good work and do better work at it than I would, as an example. But, you know, you have to have your own personal preferences. Where do you, you know, where do you turn to for something? And for me personally... It has been to turn to Mike Mayock on NFL Network. He's the person that uh, I look at that I feel like I get more out of it when he's talking about prospects, draft, and so forth uh, than anyone else. Personal preference. And he, when he was talking with Peter King, he said there have been more medical looks this year than at any point uh, that he can recall in his raft. And I think that's interesting. Here are some of the impressions he gave Peter King, Monday morning quarterback. And, of course, you know, what do you do with Trubisky? What do you do with Garrett at the front? Again, Garrett, don't get this impression. Don't get this feeling that Garrett's this all-world, all-everything, whatever. It's not like he didn't have some down games. He did. And then you got Trubisky, who has started only 13 games in his life in college. That's it. And Mayock points out, in talking to Peter King, that the Browns are an interesting mix and that they definitely have a football guy in Hugh Jackson. But they also have analytics guys in their director of strategy, Paul DePodestra, and their GM, Sashi Brown. So it's going to be interesting to see how the analytics and the football come together for them. And they also have two picks in the first 12. That's why I made the point with Matt Leon. I think the Eagles draft could be influenced by the fact that that if there is a run on quarterbacks, it then opens a wide range of options for the Eagles at 14. If there isn't, then the Eagles are slotted into only certain guys. And, of course, we know, and it's interesting, the Browns have drafted, of course, three quarterbacks lately, none of which, you know, in the first round, none of which I liked. Did not like Brady Quinn at Notre Dame. Didn't. I, I know that Brady Quinn in 2006 torched Penn State and the whole deal, and he had a big game, he and Jeff Smarja, and they don't feel like Penn State just wasn't ready. I. But you watch the tape, and I, I kept watching the tape and looking at the tape, and I'm saying, man, his footwork just isn't right. And I brought it I brought it up to Joe Paterno, and he said, look, he said, I'm not big on Brady Quinn either. Okay, Then Brandon Whedon, the former minor league baseball player, same thing, not crazy about him. And Johnny Manziel, no way. I used to kid the suit all the time on Manziel was going to beat the Steelers, but that was just a running joke on the show. I didn't think he'd make it at all. That's three guys. Trubisky is interesting because you know, and so is Miles Garrett because Garrett is a guy that when I watched him, I thought he was good, not great. When I watched Trubisky, I thought he was good, not great. I didn't see a lot of either one, but saw enough. Right, here are some of the other observations that Mike Mayock. 
uh, made to Peter King. He says, look, he said, I'm old school, but 13 games isn't enough for me with the first pick in the draft. I agree with that. I agree with that. Now, the one area he doesn't have, though, there is one area that, that there are a lot of disadvantages to only being 13 games in terms of evaluation. But one advantage is you don't have a lot of wear and tear either. That's the Terrell Davis theory of Terrell Davis going into the NFL did not get pounded at Georgia because he didn't carry the ball that much at Georgia. And he gets all the NFL, he carries the ball a lot, has some 2,000-yard years, averages 5.2 yards a carry, which is what the really good ones average. That's right, the Sioux would have reacted by now. His guy, Bettis, averaged 3.9. And that's, you know, and, and then there's Garrett, who's been hurt, too. Uh, and you watch him against UCLA. Mike Mayock says you look at him against UCLA, dominant. Against Alabama, not so dominant. Uh, let's see. He also said uh, about five years down the road, Peter King asked him about uh, Monday morning quarterback about five years down the road, how we'd look at the draft. And he said this, uh, that when you look at this year's draft, there there's more medical concern with high draft picks than I've ever seen in a draft before. So four or five years from now, there's a good chance that three or four really good prospects won't make it because of injury over anything else. I thought that was interesting. He said that one general manager sat with him. Excuse me. One GM told me, this is Mayock, telling it to Peter King, a Monday morning quarterback, sat with me. uh, He sat with his medical staff for five hours the other day to go over medical records of prominent players. And the GM said, quote, never have I been part of a draft with so many medical red flags. Wow. That's that's different. Now what do you do with Joe Mixon? As I said before about Joe Mixon, you want to be the second team that gets him and not the first team. The first team undergoes all the scrutiny of selecting him and all the scrutiny that comes with OTAs and the scrutiny of training camp. If you're the second team that gets him and he's been in the league, you're just the second team that gets him and it doesn't bring with it if if he lives a clean life. You know, he continues to lead a clean life. You're not going to get the scrutiny as the first team does. There are a lot of people that think that he will go in the middle of the second round. And one of the great Mike Mayock stats that he gave to Peter King on MMQB, we know how much Dallas wants a pass rusher. And they have been desperate as to what they've done. Signing Greg Hardy was a desperate move by a team that desperately wanted a pass rusher. I mean, it was a desperate move. I mean, that's the kind of panic move that uh, I can't respect an organization for making. And then the other one was drafting Randy Gregory. There weren't any red flags there. There were red flags all over the place about Randy Gregory, yet they still drafted him because, again, they're desperate at that position. Well, Mike Mayock told Peter King on MMQB on SI.com, Dallas, which is badly in need of an edge rusher, used 28 of their 30 on-campus visits with draft prospects on defensive players. Thought you'd find that interesting. 
Corey Chavis tomorrow, CBS Sports Netter. Thanks to Bruce Feldman today. Thursday will be off because of the Phillies, but that opens the door for us to carry the NFL draft from eight to midnight, courtesy of CBS Sports Radio. Back with more in a moment on News Radio 1070 WKOK, brought to you by Purdy Insurance. You just don't think about insurance. You buy a home, you take out a policy, and you forget about it until something happens and you need it. Then you think about insurance a lot. My agent recommended insurance from Selective. Insurance for our home and property, jewelry, even the food in our refrigerator. Selective thinks about everything so I don't have to. Selective. Response is everything. Get to know us at Selective.com. Get to know your local Selective agent. Pretty Insurance on Market Street in Sunbury or at PrettyInsurance.com. Find out what Pretty Insurance can do for you. Just remember when it comes to the NFL draft that the Cowboys a year ago desperately wanted Paxton Lynch. Remember that? They they looked to trade up. Did what they could. They could not make the deal. Then they decided, hey, look, you know what? We really want Connor Cook. Raiders take Connor Cook, and they settled for Dak Prescott. This happens all the time in the draft. Antonio Brown was the 22nd receiver taken in the 2010 draft. There have been so many lousy first rounds. 2013 might be the worst first round ever. I mean, it was just horrible. I mean, the the entire draft was just bad. It's amazing how so many picks have been over the years... You know, the draft night, they make such a big deal out of everything. And then you realize some of these guys flat out can't play. And these players get money, but, I mean, you look at that draft. It just was not. <clears throat> that was the, what, Fisher to the Chiefs draft, Luke Jokel, Ronnie Stanley, Jack Conklin, Laramie Tunsil. Uh, I mean, it's... I mean, I mean, I'm talking about Conklin, Stanley, and Tunsil all rated ahead of Fisher and Jokel. Fisher and Jokel are the first two guys. First two guys. And last year's tackles are all or offensive linemen are all better. I mean, Deion Jordan, who's out of the league right now, fourth overall pick. What? Lane Johnson missed 10 games this year. Ziggy Ansah was fifth, Arcavius Mingo sixth, Jonathan Cooper seventh, Tavian Austin, D. Milner, Chance Warmack was your top ten. I mean, bad. DJ Fluker, DJ Hayden, bad. Yep, Sheldon Richardson. Bad. Ansah and Richardson, by the way, the only two Pro Bowlers. You realize that? They're the only two that made the Pro Bowl among the top 16 picks. They're the only two have been in. Each has been in one year. Ansa went in 15, and Richardson went in the 2014 season. The only two pro bowlers in the top 16 guys. Huh? That's why you look at this draft stuff, and they've got months and months and months, and they go through every possible scenario, and guess what? I mean, D. Milner. Now, I thought D. Milner was actually a good, you know, because I saw him in person. All right, a couple times, twice. And guess what? He's not even in the league anymore. Not even in the league. G- DJ Fluker's still in the league. But to be honest with you, I didn't like him when I saw him live at Alabama. Did not like him. Didn't like him on tape. I mean, he has something you can't teach, that size. But I, I don't like, didn't like his feet. Don't like how he moves. Now his arm length is something you can't, you can't duplicate. First quarterback taken was the Bills, number sixteen, EJ Manuel. Yeah, that tells you everything. And right after that, the Steelers, number seventeen, they took Jarvis Jones. That didn't really work out either. And, and again, but in a draft like this, there's no place to turn. I mean, 13 was just a bad draft. It's just, it was just strange how that played out four years ago. Yeah, there were a couple guys like Tyler Eifert at 21, not bad. Okay? 
Desmond Trufant, not bad. I mean, the latter half of the first round, some teams did pretty well. But you already have, in the first round, three guys out of the league in four years. D. Milner's out. Bjorn Warner's out. Matt Elam's out. They're already out of the league. <laughs> Those are the first round guys from four years ago. They're not even in the league anymore. Uh, so this is a very, for all the research that they put in, and they throw in so much research on this thing, over and over, medical reports, how high you jump, how fast you run, your 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 10 time, your shuttle time, your 40 time, uh, you know, tape after tape after tape after tape after tape. And this is what they end up doing. These are the experts. This is what they end up doing. It's no surefire way to get better. Now, the NFL of the draft can make you better as a football team as a, uh, uh, quickly as opposed to the NBA, which doesn't. The NBA draft does not make anybody better. You don't go from the first overall pick to playoff contender in the NBA draft. You don't. I mean, the perfect example, the Minnesota Timberwolves. They have Andrew Wiggins first overall pick, and then acquired in the trade for Kevin Love. Carl Anthony Towns, first overall pick. So they get two of them. They go with uh, Ricky Rubio, who's uh, the point guard. And they got a really good coach in Tom Thibodeau. Well, guess what? Did you notice in the last two weeks them playing basketball at all? No. I thought Jordan Rodriguez had the best line of all out of everybody on Friday when she said on the show, said, I don't know if they're going if the, if Cleveland's going to browns it up again. <laughs> they're convinced everybody's convinced that they need to take Miles Garrett. He probably is the best choice, but he's not the surefire guy either. There are no surefire guys in this draft. None. But, well, I mean, I know I'm going to watch. Today's show brought to you by Purdy Insurance, Market Street in Sunbury on News Radio 1070 WKOK. Your station for news, weather, business, and CBS Sports Radio. News Radio 1070 WKOK Sunbury and on WKOK.com.